everyone, my name is Matthew Wong, and I'm very excited to be here on behalf of White Bear PR and Sundance uh, and my podcast, Composer Talk, to be talking with composer Jonique Bontemps and editor Cinque Northern about their work on My Name is Polly Murray. Um, I guess I'll just let you guys introduce yourselves here first, uh, but how are you doing? Doing well. Yeah, doing okay. Just excited to be here with you, Matthew. Thank you for making the time to talk to us about uh, this exciting project. Yeah, I watched the film this weekend and was blown away. Um, it's, yeah, incredible. So I want to ask, um, to start, how did the two of you meet? Uh, we actually met, it was a referral. I, I was brought on at the beginning of the project and um, and and uh, they, they kind of trusted me or trusted my ear with some of the music that I had laid in. And so they were taking, the directors were taking my suggestions for, um, for a musician and, and it was, he was basically a referral and I listened to his music and liked what I heard. And, you know, we just went on from there. Yeah, so this is actually a rare case. Well, maybe not so rare where an editor, uh, you know, is the driving force behind picking the composer and, you know, really sort of steering the music for the project. And, you know, Cinque, what were you looking for that, you know, allowed you to sort of pick me, I guess? I got a referral with a bunch of names and when I got to Jonique's music, one, I found range, but the one thing that I look for more than does this song fit this film is do I feel something? And across a wide range of, of types of scores from action to something more subtle or horror, I felt something. And, and, and I felt this, also he had a strong sense of melody. So even though I, nothing I heard would fit the film, uh, that made me want to lean in, talk more, reach out to him and, you know, just kind of learn more. Because I feel like even if they don't nail the song, if there's something there that you can work with, then that's that's what I look for. Right. So it was really this combination of range and just, I guess, emotion coming from the melodies you were hearing in, in his previous work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. Now, was this... Um, JB, did you send like a reel of music with that intention that was aimed towards the project at that point? Once you've been I, I don't think I even knew at the time because he, I think Cinque, you got the referral from a common friend, a producer that I worked with on United Skates, and he just mm -hmm. went to my website. Uh, mm -hmm. So I didn't even know that this was going on until after he heard the general reel that was on my website and decided to reach out and touch, you know, well, not physically touch me, but at least uh, <laughs> reach out and call me <laughs> for if I was interested in the, uh, in the gig. So and actually just to back up, just to, it, it wasn't entirely me. Once I liked him, then I had to run that by the directors, obviously they listened to the music. We had conversations. So when we reached out to you, I had, you know, the directors were on, were interested at least. Yes. And, you know, and I was super nervous because obviously, you know, this team, uh, participant media, these directors, you know, they had had such a huge success with the RBG. And I was like, wow, okay, this is going to be something. So I had to make sure, you know, before the meeting, when I was called to New York to meet with everybody, I made sure I watched the film. I had several conversations with uh, Cinque and Talia, Talia, uh, the producer, just to make sure that I kind of understood what they were going for with regards to the music for the picture and you know I came in with a plan I came in with some ideas obviously I ran these ideas by both Talea and Cinque first to make sure that we were all aligned and then presented them during that initial meeting and I guess it worked because you know a few days later I was called and said hey would you like to come on and help tell the story with us oh amazing and yeah so I heard that there was a lot of um I guess these instances of the music influencing the picture and vice versa. Um, so in that instance, you, you did get to see the film and then you wrote based off what you had seen? Yeah, so I got a chance to see a couple sequences because by the time, at the point when they had called me, there wasn't even an assembly cut of the entire film yet, was there? So at That's that true. first meeting, uh, Cinque sat me down at the editor's bay and said, okay, we're gonna watch some scenes. I'm like, all right, this is great. And he showed me a couple of, you know, rough sequences to get a sense of who Paulie was and how Cinque and the directorial team really wanted to tell the story. And there were a couple things that came out as far as themes were concerned that we immediately sort of uh, latched on. 
uh, Pauli Murray was, we talk about her frenetic pace, Pauli's frenetic pace and how many things Pauli did during Pauli's lifetime. We also talked about how Pauli was an American hero and how so many of the things that, especially me as an African-American, a single African-American, uh, enjoy today, freedoms, was built on Pauli's work. So Pauli was an American hero that we don't really even know anything about. So these themes really resonated with us. And then when I left New York City, came back to my studio, I just started writing some music and really tried to embed these themes in music because there was no picture yet. And my goal is if I can write a piece of music where the team can see the picture in the music without putting it to picture, then I know that we're on the right track. And I sent it to Sinkway and he said, hey, you know what, this actually works. I'm hearing all the stuff that we had talked about in the music that you sent me. And then he just started putting stuff to picture. Yeah. So um, Sinkway, then when you got this music that, I mean, it almost sounds like the music was visual in a way, in the way that uh, JP sent it to you. Um, did that influence the way that you, you edited the film? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I pretty much, I use music rhythmically when I edit. So even when it's temp, even when I know there might not even be the temporary music I'm using, which can be from any film, I use it just to get a sense of pacing and tone and, and direction. And so what was amazing about what Jonique sent me was that we literally talked about Polly Murray is, is a, you know, if you look at Polly Murray as a civil rights activist, it's, it's someone typing because Polly was about confrontation by typewriter. Polly was a lawyer, Polly was a writer. And so it was this busy kind of, and he, Jeanique really integrated into the music, this frenetic kind of tapping that was, you know, really felt like Polly's personality. So he sent a, a variety of songs that weren't, they weren't all specific to the scenes, but I could just pick and choose and drop them where I wanted. And so I started dropping them and, and actually cutting the music, not, you know, that it was his job to sort of make it work, but cutting it so he got a sense of the timing of it and where the swells were and how that, you know, as the edit developed, I would chop the music and then send it back to him. And then he'd have to figure out how to make that timing work. Yeah. Um, but it was a back and forth of that kind of thing. Yeah, it was almost as if I was building a library of music that Sinque was able to pull, a custom library, and then start building the picture with that. And then he would send it back to me so then I could go ahead and really craft in the music to work with that new sequence. And then eventually we got to the point where we had, you know, an assembly cut of the film. And at that point, I think maybe about 50% of the actual film was tempted with the original library that we were creating. Oh, that must be a, a refreshing thing as a composer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, it was, because, you know, so many times we're chasing the temp because, you know, look, people edit with the temp, it goes out to screenings with the temp, it goes to the production company with the temp and the distributor. And the, so the, the temp then becomes like the thing that you have to beat into submission, right? or that you just have to, you know, go along with. In this case, we basically had a blank canvas. I mean, obviously there was temp music in there when Sinque sent me the first set of sequences, but, you know, we talked about, well, what do we like about it? What we don't like about it? Why did you choose this? And he was very open to, you know, really wanting to go where I wanted to, to go with the score. And, you know, we really were able to find a common ground and create this from the ground up. And I also felt, just to speak a little more about the temp, I never told Jonique this, but they love the temp. Oh, really? <laughs> they were, tell me that. They, there were certain songs that they looked at me and they said, I don't know, do we have to license this? And, and I was like, you, you can't license that song. It's <laughs> from another film. But they, there were some uh, temp songs that they really, really loved. And I kept telling them, I said, believe me, when this is over, you're not going to remember the temp. Because... I just had enough faith in Jonique's ability to interpret the emotions just from the few samples. And 
I mean, he's he was really masterful at swapping out things. There's a piece in the film, and whoever, whoever hasn't seen it, I encourage you to see it. But there's a piece in the film um, where I think it's like banjo and guitar. Polly Murray is jumping on the train, and it's a very like bluegrass kind of, just totally out of the wheelhouse of the rest of the film, which is more score. It felt like a, a needle drop, and they were like, I don't know how he's going to replace this, and he replaced it. And I don't think they knew. The first time I screened it, I had to tell them, well, what do you think of the new song? And they were like, is that, is that the new song? And that just like spoke to his ability to not, it, it didn't, it was in, it, he picked up the tone without being derivative. I don't know how he does it, but like, so you feel the same emotions going through the scene, even though it's not the same song, you know? Um, so by the end of it, it, it's like they could, I would swap out a piece of temp, tell them, hey, this is a different song. And we kept swapping out temp as, as we went. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the, the power of like one, I think really good communication and then understanding about what, what the, how, how it's gonna be used in the edit, which I'm sure Joni is helpful to you um when you're when you're creating music like how is this being used you know how at what point am i hitting the, the beat too hard and when do i need to pull back when are people talking and i need to play a more subtle role i think us being able to go back and forth really allowed for us to to adjust mm -hmm. you know, to those little, little subtleties yeah i was super afraid of that cue let me tell you because i was like i don't play banjo i don't play <laughs> this is out of my right. house so I was like, okay, we're gonna hold off on this one for a little while. And by that point, by the time I had to tackle it, because it was sitting in the cut for a while, um, we had already established a couple of themes, you know, in the in the score. So we had a few melodies, we had a few motifs that were really sticking to the picture. So this is where, you know, look, collaboration comes in. I have a friend, uh, Derek Baird, he and I went to USC together. He's from North Carolina. You know, he knew all about Paulie Murray. I said, you know what, Derek, we need to work on this one together. So I shared him what I had with the score already. I shared him obviously the temp track. And then we collaborated together to, you know, create this one because it really required someone who knew that kind of music and was from that area. And he nailed it. I mean, really, we sent it in and there were like no notes, you know? So yeah. it's like, it's really important as a composer to know where your strengths are. And I had to go out and tap somebody in to bring him in. And he did help me on a couple cues, as a matter of fact, because there were a few things in, that needed that feel again. I think even the depression cue that we did, um, you know, he worked with me on that to give a solo acoustic guitar feel, that sort of solo blues guitar feel. So really it's about also having a team of people that you can rely on to really help strengthen uh, the score and give it what it needs. For sure. I'd love to touch on that a bit more in a sec, but uh, first I think we should play a clip from the film. Um, and I was wondering if you could just kind of uh, preface it and tell us what, uh, what we're going to see. Sure. So we're going to share a clip from Link that we called Lynching, and it's Paulie Murray talking about growing up in the South and how there was this constant present fear of being lynched as an African American, you know, in the South. This is a perfect example of where the music, I think, influenced the cut, and then the cut in turn influenced the music. And you're going to see a couple of punctuated hits that really bring the images alive, the, actually the horrific images alive. And that was something that, you know, Sinque and I worked several times to get it right, so that this way we could really bring this aspect of Southern living at that time to life. I had a certain kind of protected life. The point at which life became unbearable was in the contact with the white world. People addressing uh, adult Negroes as auntie and uncle, boy, You get maybe 50, 60 people a year being lynched. I don't remember lynchings being prominently portrayed in the newspapers. 
but we would hear about them by word of mouth. You know, somebody got lynched over in so-and-so county last night. The awareness of the Ku Klux Klan was always in the background. This awareness to a child of my generation uh, grows with you just like almost a part of your body and your being. So Cinque and uh, JB, do you have any uh, other things you'd like to add on in terms of these uh, percussive hits, maybe? Uh, yeah, I think th the concept was already there of, of those those punch-ins. And so we, we kind of went back and forth about where they would be. So, so in other words, he, uh, Jean-Luc did a score and I actually did the hits to the score. But as the scene got edited, as we get notes from the director, as we change things, those hits are obviously going to shift. And so it was, it's kind of a challenge for jean to figure out how to make the music still work. And so it was a common, this was a, 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 an instance where it's a combination between him shifting where the beat makes a hit and me shifting the edit. Sometimes I had to move the edit a little bit so that it, it hit on that same um, beat. So that, that was one where we did kind of go back and forth. But it was really a, funny. The timing change. There's a funny story with that one in that in one of the edits, when you had to go ahead and edit the music to work with the picture, obviously I could still hear the edit. So I'm like, okay, we gotta take care of this. So in my, you know, conforming the music to the picture, I ended up moving the hits from beat four to beat one of the actual group. And I said, like, okay, this is gonna work out great. And Cinque gets the picture, like, wait, something's not right. Did you move? <laughs> <laughs> beat hit from beat four or whatever because it's not feeling the same it's now on beat one and i was like i thought it was even better he's like no this is not it <laughs> and i realized that having you know those hits on beat four really helped with the surprise really helped with the jarring factor of the images because again from watching the clip i mean these are horrific images and they were also unpredictable and we needed to keep that unpredictable nature in the music because as an African-American in that time, lynching was unpredictable. It just happened out of the blue. And that was part of the terror of it. So when I shifted from beat one, it became predictable and he felt it right away. He, you know, we couldn't articulate exactly what the problem was, yeah. but I, okay, I understand. He's like, this is not on the same beat. We need to move it back. And I moved back to beat four. He's like, ah, he said, now all is good with the world. So, you know, it was really And great. I knew nothing about the, it being on one or four. I just knew something was, wasn't lining up the same way. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone is, um, or JB, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like a lot of people in the post world like to, you know, trust the composer because they know music. But I feel like everyone actually knows music, even if they might not have the same kind of communication tools to express it, but in this case, uh, you did, Cinque, and it wasn't the, the terminology of beat one or four. It just was off all of a sudden. Right. And it speaks to that ability for a composer to have to know how to translate something with musical terminology to get the right emotional impact. Yeah. And I think that's and, an important thing of working with uh, filmmakers is that, you know, with filmmakers, they are trained to do every other job in making a film except for making the music. Right. So really, as a film composer, we have to be able to discuss in terms of drama, in terms of sequence, in terms of editing. We have to understand that vocabulary because then it's our job to take that and turn that into our musical vernacular for us and the rest of our team. So being able to communicate in that way, I think, has been very important for me as a composer in general and definitely came into play in this project. And, and as an editor, you know, when we look at music, 
especially editors. I'm an editor where music is a, is a really important element for me, just creatively. Um, some el editors less so, not that any either is better or worse, but some editors just slap the music on kind of at the end. Just depends on the type of material you're cutting. But for me, I look at music, dialogue, image, and sound effect as, as just ingredients putting into a pot to cook something. And if something is too salty, if music is just another, just like picture and words, and I don't give words any more value than sound or music. So it's, it's this constant kind of balancing what has the emotional impact, you know, and, and sometimes the music takes the lead and sometimes the words take the lead. Sometimes it's just image or sometimes it's just sound, you know? So that's a constant like tweaking that you're doing as an editor. So you, you hear, whereas Yonique can create it, I just hear it as an element, you know, that I'm balancing with, with the other elements. Right. Well, that comes off through the entire story that there's almost like this whole macro approach of how music works throughout the entire film in terms of pacing and getting you from one scene to the next. And um, I mean, one other thing, uh, we talked a bit about the banjo cues and guitar stuff, but it felt like there was almost three different like sonic worlds to me of like guitar slash banjo music to like these piano score moments to the more I don't want to say traditional scoring things, but there there was recorded uh, orchestra for it. So yes, there, yes, there was. Yes, um, I was able to work okay. with one of my uh, USC connections to contract an orchestra in Moscow. And I was a little concerned because when you hear the score, there's a lot of soloistic elements into it. Solo French horn, solo flute, solo clarinet, uh, because we decided early on that we were going to give each of the major figures in Pauli's life a different instrument so that this way we could identify them and have them interplay with Pauli's more frenetic and active piano is what we decided was going to be the voice of Pauli. So I was really concerned, you know, because I have been sort of thought about LA musicians and working with LA and that was my original thought when I wrote this music but I trusted my friend and he was able to contract uh, musicians from the you know, Moscow Philharmonic and you know, they killed it, they nailed it and everything came out so wonderful and beautiful. But I think you're actually right, Matthew, that we did have sort of three pals that we worked with. It was the more sort of, uh, for lack of a better term, Southern you know, country kind of sound. We had, again, these uh, Pauli, which again was, Paulie's instrument was piano and having that throughout. And then we had these other sort of characters that came in and out of Paulie's life that were represented by these other instruments as well. And then all throughout that, there was this sort of plucking sound, this pizzicato string plucks that we used to really add that energy and to also give it a life and a bounce. You know, I realized that I love syncopation and I end up putting syncopation, maybe, maybe, maybe it's a little too much, but I love putting syncopation in, in the music. So there's a lot of syncopated rhythms with these uh, pizzicato strings all throughout the, the, the scene. And the one thing I have to realize is that sometimes people equate pizzicato strings with like comedy. And I don't think that came across this way. I think we actually had the right use to be able to give the effect that we wanted, which was gravity, energy, and also uh, a little bit off kilter. Mm -hmm. And intention, this driving intention, it, it's, it's like the theme of someone who is about doing something, you know, the, there's, the, that's how it feels to me, at least the themes that are, that are Polly Murray's themes. Yeah. Um, another element too, it's, I think the variety in the music speaks to, sometimes the music is about the environment that Polly is in. And then sometimes the music is the voice of Polly or the voice of someone in Polly's life. I think those things dictated whether it was going to be a guitar that's just kind of representing the Dust Bowl or the depression, that those times the music were Polly's environment. And then other times it was, you could tell it was what, it's Polly's voice. For sure, yeah. And I love what you said there, JB, about taking something that is, or I guess like kind of subverting expectations with music, because I feel like there was a lot of that going on with the score and with pizzicato strings being a thing that you know, kind of 
has that motion for comedy, but then using it in a different way, all of a sudden it just gives another character to, to the music. And then Polly was quirky. Mm-hmm. And I think that was something we talked about early on. I, I think I did, I do remember us having lunch and I was like, you know, there's a lot of heavy material in this. Polly is a busybody. Polly has a dynamic smile. I don't think it, there isn't a heaviness that I get from Polly. There's a, mm-hmm. it's just a frenetic kind of like, now we do this, now we do that. There's a quirky comedy to her, you know, anyway. Right. And, it, you know, I decided to try and represent that again in these syncopated rhythms with these pizzicato strings. So having things, you know, off the beat or subverting expectations of when things should fall. It's always fun to see the musicians look at the page and like, whoa, okay, I gotta, guess I gotta pay attention because these <laughs> beats are all over the place. But uh, it was really, I think, indicative again of Paulie's nature to have this frenetic off kilter, off beat music to represent Paulie. Yeah, for sure. Well, um, last question here uh, is about Sundance for both of you, as this is a panel for Sundance. Um, and JB, I know that you were a fellow in 2013, and then you've had a lot of experience with uh, the Institute Sense. And I was wondering if you could just both talk about what it means to have this film at Sundance. Wow. Well, okay. Well, this is, I think, my third or fourth film uh, at Sundance. And I am really proud of this one because Polly, I think we already talked about, is an American hero. Polly is someone that we don't know anything about in our culture. We don't teach Polly. And to have Polly's story be premiered at you know, the premier film festival in the world is is appropriate for everything that Paulie has done for our society. So I'm super excited that this project is happening on this stage because people are gonna see it. People are gonna know who Paulie is. And honestly, this is the, the, the film that we need for the current time that we are in. With so much divisiveness going on in our country, Paulie, and Paulie's story is going to build empathy and getting it out to the world. This is the time to do it. Yeah, echo that in the, the importance of Polly being on a big platform. When, when I first started this project, I had never heard the name Polly Murray in any way. And once I understood what they did, I was amazed that I had never learned sooner. Um, And so I really feel like with the help of the music and what we did, you were able to experience Polly's world through Polly's eyes. That was our goal, is that it wouldn't be an intellectual exercise, but an emotional journey. That's really what we set out to do. And the music played a huge role in that, in really giving Polly a voice that we we could connect with. Um, So, you know, having this sort of acknowledge that Sundance means it's everything, you know, just, just the level that it, the, the amount of people that will see it and see what Polly contributed, I think, you know, is very exciting. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. This is my first Sundance, so. And, you know, it's also indicative of the direction that the film team had from the very beginning, which was they don't want audiences just to learn about Polly. They want audiences to experience Paul. And that means that the experience needs to cover different ways of storytelling. Yes, there's talking, it's a documentary, so of course there's talking and the people talking about Paulie. But the team uh, and Synchronite had lots of discussions about there are other ways for people to experience Paulie. There's parts of the film where there's just text on screen and you're reading Paulie's poems because Paulie wrote poems. And there's music accompanying that text. There's animation where we're actually reenacting uh, things in Polly's life through animation and music. So there's opportunities to really experience who Polly was without someone talking about who Polly was. 
And I think that really leads to the emotional journey that the film team really set out to do. Amazing. Well, I'm so excited for everyone to, to see the film and just want to say thank you so much, Sinkway and Janique, for, uh, for all the hard work you did on this amazing project. And yeah, so excited to see where it goes. Well, thank, thank you. you so much, Matthew, for the time. All we want to know is that Paulie's just going to tell us, well done. Well done, JB and Sinkway. Well done.